Hello and thanks for tuning in today to Cedar Creek Homestead Coffee Time. Um, it's too cold to be outside today so I've decided to make this video inside and uh, I hope you're having a wonderful day and appreciate you tuning in. I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about homesteading. There's been kind of a little stink uh, brew been going on around with the other homesteaders and I wanted to give my little stand point. I've already mentioned this last week a little bit, but way that I stand on the issue. I think anybody that has a place that you are making your home and you do anything there to help sustain you, um, I believe you're homesteading. Now there's different levels of homesteading. Some raise everything. Some do not have electricity. Uh, some choose not to have running water. Um, some of the running water is you running and going and getting it. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I like the more independent lifestyle. And I like the idea of uh, the old way of homesteading like the old timers did. But a lot of the old timers, when they come to this part of Oklahoma where I live, they had no choice but to live off grid. There was no electricity. Until the electric co-ops come through, there was no electric. There was no phone lines, uh, no cars, no UPS, no FedEx, no Amazon. So things were much, much different in that time than they are today. So uh, I could raise almost all of my food. I couldn't go get stuff like coffee and sugar, but I could raise most of my food if I needed to. Uh, I don't because I still work on a job. I have a job. I own my own business, and I work every day, Monday through Friday, a lot of times on Saturdays. I do not work on Sunday. I don't even work in the garden on Sunday. I set a day aside once a week to rest and to go to church and to serve the Lord. I serve the Lord every day, but I certainly on Sundays, I set that day aside. What you do is your business, I'm not preaching to anybody, but that's just how I live my life. And with having my own business, there's days that I have to stay home a little longer. Maybe there's rabbits to butcher. Maybe there's vegetables to pick out of the garden. Maybe the garden needs weeded. I'll get out and do that early in the morning. Then I go to work uh, later in the morning. I'll come in and shower and clean up. I have running water. I have electricity. Now I have sources of water. Uh, there is a well on our property close to our house. If we had to get water, it has sulfur water but it's still drinkable and usable. You'd have to hold your nose when you drink it, but we have water. I'm working on a guttering system to catch water catchment. Uh, I would like to have a nice uh, setup like uh, some of the ones do on uh, YouTube, the other homesteaders. Uh, some homesteaders don't do anything with water catchment. Um, one of the things I'd like to be prepared just in case things happen, the way this world's going today, uh, we don't know what's coming, and I'd like to kind of be a little prepared. I think common sense tells us we could lose electricity where we're at, uh, and we have before like a week at a time. A tornado could come through. Our power supply line, uh, we are the end of the line, and our electric co-op goes a very long way. And when I was a kid, we were without electricity a whole lot, so we still had um kept water put up so we'd have water in the house because we had a spring. The springs on our property, we could get water from that now, but we had a pump that pumped the water to the house, but uh, we'd have to, uh, uh, if we didn't have the electricity, we couldn't get to have water. So mom and dad would have a way for water, and we had an outhouse that we could use. I rarely had to ever use the outhouse, but there were times we'd be without electricity for several days because the power lines weren't of the quality that they are now and we'd be out for a while. Um, Mom used a clothesline. We had things uh, uh, pretty primitive. We raised our own chickens. Had Dad usually raised at least one hog. We had our own eggs. Dad milked a cow. Um, we had we kind of homesteaded but we had modern things as I grew up. But I wanted to share a story with you about my great-grandparents. They moved to north of Tahlequah, Oklahoma, in a covered wagon. My grandpa used to tell this story. He was a little boy, and they moved from a place in Arkansas called Oil Trough, Arkansas. It's just a spot on the map. 
It's up towards the Jonesboro area of Arkansas, kind of the northeast part of Arkansas. And they moved over here to the northeast corner of Oklahoma, up near the, the Tahlequah area. They came here in a covered wagon um, and settled up there. They did not have running water, no electricity, had to bring enough goods with them to survive a while until they could get a garden going and get things up and running. Until they died, my grand, great-grandmother uh, raised a garden. She had a, uh, moved into town at Gore in her older years, and she looked like Granny Clampett. I, if I can find a picture, I will post it on this video of what her and my great-grandfather looked like, but she reminded me of Granny Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies. And she raised a very big garden. When she died, her cupboards were full of canned goods, and she lived uh, up in her 90s uh, to a ripe old age. And uh, after my grandpa died, she still canned and still survived and had a milk cow up until uh, pretty late years. And uh, I can remember her having the milk cow, and I remember her having uh, chickens, and she raised a lot of her own food. People back in the old time didn't have any choice. They didn't have any money to buy food. Uh, there was some government assistance, but you had to feed yourself, and that's the only way they knew how. She lived in town, had a couple of lots down in, uh, right in town. Now there's an insurance place on one of those lots that she had. Had a big old pecan tree in her yard, and she would pick up pecans, and that lady could make the best pecan pie out of them little old bitty native pecans that grow around here. We've got them abundantly around this area, and my great-granny could really roll those things. Uh, she dipped snuff out of a snuff. Uh, she had to buy them little jars, little jars that had the snuff. This may not be appealing to you, but I think it's kind of neat that her glasses were snuff jars. If you've ever drank out of a snuff jar, that's uh, what she did. If there any bad habits she had, she liked to dip snuff. I'll tell you a few little funny stories. She had screen doors on her home and used to, for some reason, the homes had uh, two doors on the front porch. And they would move the living room around. The house, you kind of went around in a circle. You go into the living room and then kind of into the dining room, kitchen, and the back around. And you could just go around. Most of the ho old homes around here had a lean-to built onto them that they turned into a restroom area and would put, install the washer and dryer because the homes when they were built there was it wasn't any running water um, but my granny um, they would uh, one she kept saying that she got to where she didn't see as good and she said uh, that she had rat problem and she set these big old huge they're like mouse traps but they're like this big and my granny would set those, and uh, the stuff would drag them off. So we would go down there on Sundays and have dinner. And I'll tell you something, when I was a little boy that was neat around what we live at, everything closed on Sunday. And almost everybody went to church somewhere. And after church, we would gather down to my great-granny's house, and everybody would bring kind of like a potluck dinner, but my great-granny did most of the cooking. And we would gather down there and eat. And, oh, it was so much fun. I'd play with all of my cousins and stuff. And, but every store in town was closed. You couldn't have went out to eat on a Sunday because nothing was open in town. And we rarely went out to eat. And if we had a pop, a pop was a luxury. And, uh, I mean, a real luxury. Usually it was drinking iced tea um, or water. But anyhow, we would go down there. Well, we were there eating one day. And uh, this half-grown possum comes running down through my granny's house, my great-granny's house. And uh, it runs around. Anyway, a possum come down through the living room with everybody there and uh, in my great-granny's house. And the, uh, she said, there goes one of them rats right now, but it was a half-grown possum. And it ran around behind her divan. Well, what had happened, she had cats hung around her house, and they would scratch up the screen door, and a hole had gotten started, and a mama possum had gotten in her house, and it had a litter of babies in the divan. 
Well, the men, they get to the divan thinking they're going to take it outside and kill this possum that has gotten in the divan. And uh, they take it outside and they turn it over. And underneath there, you know, you kind of have a netting comes up under furniture. Well, the, they had tore a hole something had. I guess the possums had done it. But they were up in there. And they take garden hoes, uh, you know, the chopping hoe, and they get them from my granny's garden, and they start killing possums. And I'm going to tell you, as a little boy, probably eight or nine year old, I thought that was the neatest thing I ever seen, was having a killing possum, possum killing, possum, possum killing at my great granny's house. So uh, another story I'll tell you real quick. There was a man lived across the road from my uh, uh, grandmother, and uh, he wasn't quite right. And uh, his name was Don, and he was a little, had a little bit of issues. But he was a nice person, a good person. A lot of people made fun of him and treated him bad. But my great-granny, she always took care of him. When it was Thanksgiving, she'd have someone bring him over some food at Christmas and stuff and send him a pie every once in a while. And she really took care of him, and, and she loved this Don. Not, uh, you know, she cared about him and a Christian love for him and uh, kind of felt sorry for him. Well, one night... I spent the night at my granny's, and she had these beds that were way up off the ground. I don't know why they had beds back in those days that were so far up off the ground, but it, you had to almost have a ladder to get up there. And as a little kid, I had to have help getting up in the bed. And you may have seen them. If, I don't know why the old-timers did that, but their beds would be way up off the ground. So uh, we get up and go to sleep, and uh, my granny, uh, I said, What about Don? And she said uh, something about, well... He goes to sleep with the chickens. Well, I had never heard that term before. And I thought, uh, I kept thinking about him, and I was like, uh, he's going to get cold out there with the chickens. And finally, I said, Granny, won't he get cold out there with the chickens? And she said uh, something like, Hush, smart Alex said, I wasn't meaning that he's sleeping out there with the chickens. I mean, he goes to bed at the same time as the chickens. And the only time I ever knew her to be fussy with me, but she thought I was being a smart aleck, but I was just telling the truth about what was what I thought, and now I know what that means. The chickens go to bed right at dark, and that's what she meant about Don, that he had went to bed right at dark. Another story that my grandpa uh, used to tell, um, this is my grandpa, not my great-grandfather, but he said they, he was a little fella, and they had come in this covered wagon from Arkansas, and it was a pretty big journey to get to where they were at. And uh, so you didn't have telephones and things, and you had to rely upon the mail. Uh, can you imagine today if you had to rely upon the mail to get a hold of your loved ones? Well, when they got where they were going, they wrote a letter to um, their relatives back in uh, Arkansas, and... Uh, then they wrote them back, and he said the whole process took two or three weeks, you know, to write a letter to them, tell them you've made it okay, and then for them to have your address and to write back to you and all this and say they got your letter. Well, in the process, this dog they had had followed them, an old hound dog, and he said they wrote him back and said, by the way, your dog is back here. And that old hound dog had followed them all the way from Oil Trough to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and had went clear back to... Um, Arkansas where they came from but a little bit about homesteading my great grandparents were homesteaders and my granny as I've said earlier had a milk cow chickens a big garden clear up until the time that she died she I don't know think she still had the milk cow but she had chickens and stuff up pretty close to her death and had cupboards just full of canned goods but I think it helped keep her healthy because she stayed physically active. And that's one problem with people today is they retire, they don't do anything. They don't can do any kind of activity. They don't work in the garden, uh, nothing. And then they go to the store and buy everything or have it delivered. It's starting to happen today. You, there's delivery services will deliver all your groceries to you. And I believe in the future we won't have grocery stores like we have now. This is something that will change. But I'll tell you another uh, little thing. My other grandmother, on my mom's side, uh, not my great-grandmother, but just grandmother on my mom's side, uh, her name was Nada. And uh, she lived in a town not far from where I was raised. And uh, 
lived out in the country and uh, had lived there many years. And when we were kids and we'd go visit there, she had a well outside. And if they wanted water, you went out to the well and she dropped one of those big, long, silver uh, well buckets. I've got one so I could use my well if I needed to. I've got one to use like what she had. And she was always afraid we would fall into this hand-dug well that she had. And she'd tell us to get back. But when they wanted iced tea, well, they'd have to run out there to the well and get water. They had outhouses. An outhouse, if you're not familiar with that, was just an old wooden structure. Um, now, you might think that sounds like fun. Uh, I never did like going to the outhouse. And uh, one of my uncles would tell us scary stories, and the outhouse was down by the creek. And it had two holes, two toilet seat, seat lids from what I remember. And I still to this day don't know why you'd want to go in the bathroom with somebody else, but it had two places. And they would have a bag of lime, and you would dip a little bit of that lime when you got through on the bathroom part, and that's uh, kept the flies down. Now, it may sound nasty to you. You want to be a homesteader? That's how they homestead. Now they have composting toilets. If you want to go back to the old, old time homesteading, it was different. I'm thankful for running water. I'm thinking for indoor, to, indoor toiletry. One of my aunts dated a man here locally, and uh, their, their family did not have running water and stuff. It's been years before I was ever even born. But she said uh, that he come to their house for dinner, and they had to put in indoor, they built a lean-to on their home and put indoor toilet. And my aunt said that, this uh, aunt on my dad's side, she said uh, that this guy wouldn't eat in her home and said he wouldn't eat in the same home that she used the bathroom in. That's funny, but think of it today. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, to take showers, my dad and him would go down on the creek and uh, take a bath in the creek. That's how you took, or you would run water in the house in a tub of some sort. You would carry water in, and uh, if like my dad's family, I think there was 11 of them. And can you imagine being the last one to take a bath? I mean, the water would be filthy, and that's how you done it. In fact, when we grew up, my mom had us take a bath with uh, me and my two sisters. Uh, we would, uh, they'd take baths first, and then I had to get in the water. Well, if we'd all been out playing in outside, plus the old soap and stuff, I mean, you felt like you were just as dirty when you got out of the water as you was when you got in. And we had running water, but it was because that's how my mom and her family, that's the way they were raised. They didn't know much different. Um, but I'm, we're so blessed today, and I like modern conveniences. I could survive without all these things if I had to. When I grew up, we had wood heat. Uh, we cut our wood and uh, split it. As a kid, everybody had work to do. Everybody helped work in the garden. Uh, I would feed the hogs when I was a young boy, um, feed the chickens. I had chores to do, and uh, that just was the way of life, and that's the way it had been for my dad, and that's the way things were handed down. Now we're so blessed with modern things that I can see that concern of people being so hooked on modern conveniences that they wouldn't be able to survive if something went wrong. But yet at the same time, you aren't wrong if you use modern conveniences. And I'm going to tell you, everybody, everybody that's out there on YouTube land that is putting out videos and claiming to be homesteaders are using some type of modern convenience. And UPS and FedEx were not invented back at the time of the old homesteaders. So... Uh, when they ordered in things from Sears and Roebuck catalog, it come through the U.S. mail, or you had to go down and pick it up at your local Sears store. And uh, so now people order things in for their farms, for your homestead, and you're ordering those in from Amazon and places that use several different means of mailing. And you use Internet and computers. You use camera to film with. So nobody is 100% like the old homesteaders. But it's a neat and exciting life to try to get back to that old-time way. Getting back to my grandmother, Nada, just a few things that were interesting about her. They had guttering around her house, homemade guttering, 
that brought the water from the runoff from the house down into a cistern in the front of the house. And it had an old hand pump, and you could get water up out of that if you needed to. The washer, she had electricity. The house had not been wired really for electric, but it had been added on to for electric when they got electricity. And they put a ringer, Maytag ringer washer on the front porch. Um, I have a part of an old washer that was a paddle washer, and we've got an old ringer washer uh, on the property. And this paddle washer, you would set like a bicycle and ride it and uh, uh, paddle it. Some of the old washing machines had a gasoline engines on them. Um, anyway, it's pretty neat how people used to do it. My grandmother had a ringer washer on the front porch, not a dryer, but a ringer washer. The dryer uh, was her clothesline. And she would do her laundry on Saturdays, just almost religiously. There was a certain day of the week, I believe it was Saturday, that she would do the laundry. They'd put foot tubs, what we call foot tubs, are big silver metal tubs. You can still buy them at tractor supply in places. And they would put that underneath the downspouts of where the guttering came out and uh, catch water. And you would see that there at her home where they'd try to catch the water. Instead of going into the cistern in the front of the house and having to pump the water back out, they got smart and just put them foot tubs and they could just carry the water up and pour it into the washer. I remember her making hominy one time when we went to her home. She raised a garden, lived to be in her 90s, and passed away just uh, not very, uh, maybe a year or two ago, she passed. Uh, this is my grandmother on my mom's side. Um, but uh, I believe part of her longevity, and uh, in fact, until she got around 90, she had never been in the hospital. And uh, I believe she had every one of her children at home, had uh, 12 children, uh, lived what I think a very healthy life. <laughs> she had uh, one bad habit, like my great-grandmother that dipped snuff, this grandmother liked to chew uh, tobacco. And it was that old stuff that I used to think it looked like a Fig Newton. In fact, I thought it was a Fig Newton. It'd be wrapped up in like a little wrapper, and she would bite her a big chunk of that off. Now, you would never known that she did that until you seen her do it. She was very clean. There was never nothing around in front of you that would have made you think that she chewed that stuff or dipped it, whatever you called it. But uh, my dad and her sons and a bunch of them got together, and they built a lean-to on her home and added a uh, bathtub and put a washer and dryer and a toilet in this little lean-to. And they put a well out there, a well pump where the... Uh, pump house where the well was and uh, got to where she had water into her home. She didn't have a telephone until her older years and uh, if you, and she would go down and send the kids down the road to use somebody's phone, a neighbor's phone, and when she believed if you used the telephone was only for emergencies or very important information. You shared what you had to say and you got off the phone. Even though her children would have helped her and paid her bill, I'm sure they did pay the bill for her, uh, when she finally got a phone because they was afraid something would happen to her and she'd need emergency services and couldn't get them. So um, uh, they'd go, when I'd call her and talk to her, you know, at Christmas or sometime and want to see how she was doing, why she'd just talk for a little bit and she'd want to get off the phone because she believed uh, that the phone was for serious business only. But uh, the old timers had it different. And uh, so that means uh, if he's going to live a homestead life, you have to get rid of your cell phones. Oh, my, most people couldn't do that. Uh, I could make it without mine, I believe. I, I hate to talk on the phone. I hate the phone. I have to deal with the phone a lot during the day. And when I retire, I think I'm going to throw away my cell phone when I retire. I've got a long time till I can retire. When I do, I'm going to throw the cell phone away. Or if I get set up enough to be self-sufficient like I'd like to, I think I will throw my phone away, and we even have a landline phone. I'll probably cut the cord on that, too, and have a peaceful, quiet life. Uh, but uh, anyway, for now, I have to stay hooked up to the, the line there. And uh, But I hate having to talk on the phone all the time. But there's uh, things of the old homesteading that I think are very interesting and very neat. And uh, my grandmother, step-grandmother, uh, used to tell a story. She come from New York City, 
and she is originally from Rome, Italy, and she had been sent here during World War II to protect her from, uh, I believe, uh, I'm not quite sure what to protect her. I mean, because the war had broke out, but I don't really think her dad was on the right side, but I better not quote all the things exactly, and she's not with us anymore to explain exactly why they sent them over here. But just to make a long story short, she said that she come here with my grandpa. He was doing tower work, and she'd come here um, with my step-grandpa to uh, Oklahoma and uh, went to his mother's house and said they were going to have chicken for uh, supper. So she thought they would go downtown. The town that we live in wasn't much, and it's not much now, but it sure enough wasn't much uh, back way back then, 60, 70 years ago. But she thought they would go down and get a chicken like they did in New York City. You just go down and get you a chicken. Well, she said they went outside, and that my grandmother caught a chicken and rang its neck off. My uh, um, Her going-to-be mother-in-law rang the chicken's neck off, and they cleaned it right there, and that's what they ate. They cooked it up and had fried chicken. And she said it was quite a culture shock. Now imagine that many years ago. So there's a big difference in different lives all over uh, the country and all over the world. And it'd make you wonder why we would want to get back to a homesteading lifestyle. I'll tell you, my main reason is I love it. I love growing my own food. I love growing, uh, being kind of self-sustainable. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you, you can't ever make it all on your own, and you certainly cannot make it without the Lord. It takes Jesus, and I would never want to say that I could make it without his help. I pray every day for his help and his blessings, and he blesses me, and he keeps me. But I want to say that um, we will not ever be 100% self-sufficient, but that being kind of self-sufficient is rewarding to me, and I enjoy it. And I hope you enjoy the homesteading lifestyle and I sure appreciate you listening in to this coffee time this week, and uh, I hope you're doing well, and I'm enjoying the videos we're getting to watch, you all that are putting up uh, uh, videos and stuff, we are really enjoying that. We're enjoying a new, kind of a new YouTuber called Flutie Lick, we really enjoy their videos, and uh, uh, we're just enjoying everybody's, and I tell you, I wish you well, uh, we're praying for you, and may God bless you. And may you have a wonderful day. We'll see you next week on Coffee Time at Cedar Creek Homestead.